Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Once again, thank you for joining us again this week on the program as we continue uh, to talk about uh, some things from the book of Joshua. We've been talking about for several weeks now the patterns of how many of these Old Testament pictures so powerfully fit uh, as types and shadows of a greater fulfillment in the days of Jesus. And we began to share last uh, week with you how that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to go ahead and read that again uh, from 1 Corinthians 10. It says, Moreover, brethren, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages have come. Now, uh, I'm going to have somebody from my team bring the chart back up on uh, this screen for you in a moment to show you the patterns of how this works. When he said, uh, these things happened as examples. So everything, what he's saying, everything that happened to them under Moses through the wilderness journey, and we have really covered this quite a bit throughout this series, how there is an Exodus paradigm all the way through the Scriptures. Because we see how that as they are uh, leaving Egypt, they're delivered by the blood of a lamb. Jesus became the real lamb. We see how they entered into the wilderness and they ate manna in the wilderness. Jesus grabs that and said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead, but I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. We know that they drank from a rock that was smitten and that, that is fulfilled in Christ as He was the rock that was smitten. If you can bring that up on the screen from somebody over there on the uh, media team to bring me up the chart there on the uh, ends of the ages, if we can get that up. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it in just a minute. But every time that they did something, the manna that fell in the backyard was a picture of Christ. The serpent on the pole was a picture of Christ, because even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so we see, even as Jesus comes to the end of His, uh, his life on earth, He gives them the Passover. Yep. because he's initiating another exodus. But this time he's initiating an exodus out of an old covenant system. And one of the things that I use to hang this on, and by the way, if you've missed any of them, you can go back to our YouTube channel and watch them because we've archived everything. People binge watch these and they yeah. use them in yeah. school sometimes. Some of the schools are using some of our material uh, to teach this. Uh, because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 gives you the, what to hang this on, but the reality of it is, is that uh, he said everything that happened to them happened as examples. And I use this, this thought from Revelation 11 verse 8, where it says their dead bodies, talking about the two witnesses, which I believe speaks of Moses and Elijah, a, a picture of Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. He said, he said that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. So he's pointing at Jerusalem saying, what you thought was Egypt is not Egypt. But Egypt is coming out of an old covenant system that made you a slave and not a servant, where somebody told you when to get out of bed, how many bricks to make, how much straw to gather, how much money to give in offerings, when to do the... Because what happens when you're under that kind of a slave master, you don't have to be led by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But they that are led by the Spirit are sons of God. But we, what we've been showing is that this pattern is uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, he said, upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have come. 
So we, we drew, I used this picture that I drew up, in, at least this is how I picture it in my head, that the old covenant age is pictured as this circle, and the new covenant age is pictured as this circle. But where these two ages converge, there's a lap over. Mm-hmm. What the book of Hebrews says, the law was fading away, and that the way into the most holy place was not yet made while the first tabernacle still stood. So the temple has to be destroyed. Yep. And order an, an old covenant Judaism has to be removed in order for them to come into their promised land. And so we're showing how these patterns of Jericho are a picture of old covenant Jerusalem in AD 70, because Jesus gave the prophecy in 30 AD that this generation would not pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. I know I'm, do, I'm describing this fast because we've already covered this in, in prior programs. But just like, uh, you know, uh, th- that was fading away and that Jesus gave this prophecy in 30 AD, he said, this generation, which is 40 years, will not pass away until everything I told you comes to pass, including great tribulation, the destruction of the temple, the fall of Jerusalem. All of that would occur within that generation, not this generation, that generation. He gave that prophecy in 30 AD and in 70 AD, 40 years just like the wilderness journey was 40 years, they were supposed to be coming out. And it is during that period of time that you see the apostles preaching the gospel. (laughs) Under the old covenant, you had 12 patriarchs. In the new covenant, you've got 12 apostles. And they're leading another exodus out. Um, And, you know, even as I look back at so many patterns, Jeremy, you know, the book of Joshua starts out by saying, now Moses, my servant, is dead. Well, even when you were talking, and, and, and Joshua was going to come on the scene. So Joshua's Hebrew word, Yeshua. You yeah. know, go ahead. Well, when I was thinking, even when you were talking, is that when the promise to them, even when they left Egypt and was going to enter into, God wanted to bring them in the first time, when they sent in the twelve spies, as He's telling them, this is a land that floweth with milk and honey, and He says, this is a land that's a good land. He says, I'm going to give you houses you did not build, vineyards you did not plant, and He says. I will go before you, and I would like hornets. I think it, I think the scripture is like hornets, and I will drive out the inhabitants from before you. And I thought about even that when we were, you were just mentioning about even on the time, the day of Passover, Jesus. One of the things he said is he says, uh, "I go." He says, uh, "In my Father's house are many mansions." Wasn't so I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. Now we have heard that scripture quoted, and many times it's been. That's still one of those people hear that and they're looking off to the future. You know, but Jesus was talking about the in my father's house with many mansions, but he said that word mansions is the word abode. He goes down later and he says, Me and my father, we're going to take up our abode or our mansion. Same Greek word. Inside of you. Yeah. And so it is not only Christ, but we know that we are in Christ and it's Christ in us. So that's the abode that he was talking about, but he described, but I think it's incredible. He calls it a mansion. Yeah. In my father's house are many mansions. And I said it, we, I, we've said it many times in this study of the book of Joshua, is what kept them out when the 12 spies went in the first time is they said, they are giants in this land. The sons of Anak are there. And so we are grasshoppers in our own eyes, so we'll be in theirs. And that's what kept them out the first time. If there are giants in this land, and these are the houses that God has given them and the vineyards that God said, I'm going to give you. And that means it wasn't just enough to get by. These were giant houses. Yeah, they weren't cabins in the corner. They were giant houses. They were mansions. Yeah. They were the abode that God was preparing. They asked Jesus, they said, well, you know, where I'm going, you don't know yet, but you will hereafter. He said, how do we know, how do we know where you're going? He said, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we've talked about this in the, even in these past segments of Jesus saying, this was the examples. These are the patterns, but I am. And so even when they're talking about, you know, so we're, when we're talking about this, even this, 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 this natural place that was the promised land, it was still an example of what God was really preparing for us is that we were to be the mansions, the abode. We were the places God was taking up his residence. So again, another reason why, even while we have to look at this, why did this old temple have to be destroyed? Because God didn't want to live in that temple no more. Yep. He wasn't interested in being caught. Being, it was really, that was confining to God because he was caught behind that, that veil of that most holy place. Yep. And that's all the place he could dwell. Nobody could look upon him. Yep. Nobody could have a relationship with him. 
It was just sacrifices. It was just once a year a priest going in and sprinkling blood. And it was no, God had lost his relationship with the people because the people were scared. And the law shut up faith. It, it kept them. Like no man could look upon the Father and live. Jesus then in that same scripture where he's talking about the Father and me going to take up the boat, he says, if you, you know, uh, me, he said, uh, show us the Father. I think it was uh, yeah. Thomas said, show us the Father that it might suffice. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, no man has seen the Father except for the Son. But he, what, he showed, what he's telling them is the reason why nobody's seen the Father except for the Son is because in this old covenant, he's trapped in that most holy place. Yep. And it's, 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 it's a separation where you can't have relationship because of sin. But what I'm about to do is make the end to sin. And even with the, the death of Jesus on the cross, it is that fulfillment of Jesus said, I did not, I did not come to do away with the law. Not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass until all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my, my words will not pass away. In the Jewish mindset, heaven and earth was not this and this. Heaven and earth was that most holy place. It's where heaven and earth met. It's yep. the interface. Yeah. And so what he's, when Jesus is saying that, he's talking about that heaven and earth yeah. will pass. Yeah. But my word, it will stand. And so he's showing them, but he's saying, he said, you know, that's going to pass. But he, so the whole, he, the reason why he had to die on the cross is because the wages of sin was death. And so he couldn't, ju- he, in order to fulfill the law, he couldn't just do, he had to, that, there had to be the sacrifice, there had to be the death. So Jesus says, if I be lifted up, on the cross, speaking of the death that he would, he said, I'm going to draw all men unto me. And he even he even connects that to that wilderness journey again. He says, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up. I be lifted up. I will draw all men unto me. Yep. You know? And so he, he died on that cross. So it was the death of all men. So that what fulfilled the law, I mean, it was not just, he did, yes, he, he fulfilled everything the law required. But the last requirement of that law is there had to be a death. Yeah. And it not only had to be a death, uh, it had to be a death there. And so he brought all men into himself and brought an end. He fulfilled it. Yeah. So that we're not, so if you're still waiting on a judgment to come from this death, yeah. your judgment was on this cross. Yeah. The, yeah. Only reason, the only reason there would ever be another judgment is because you, you fail to connect to this first death. Yeah. And that's what happened to natural Israel is that they failed to connect to this first death. Just like they didn't put blood on the doorpost in Exodus. They didn't do it again. And then the plagues of the book are the same ones you see in Egypt. All of those plagues came upon them again. And just like you see, I'm probably maybe jumping ahead of you here, but even as you were saying about how Jericho connects to the city of Jerusalem, they there were seven priests getting ready to blow seven trumpets. And you get in the book of Revelation, there are seven trumpets that begin to sound. And actually, again, these pr- trumpets are plagues. You know, mm-hmm. I, I would say this as well. You know, when, when they got ready, when Moses got ready to die, God said, I want you to teach the people this song. They called it the Song of Moses. It's in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, because after your death, these people are going to go whoring after other gods again. And then I'm going to bring upon them all the covenant curses that they literally had called upon themselves. I'm going to bring these curses upon them, all the curses of Deuteronomy. And I want you to teach these songs because in the generation to come, I want you to generation after generation after generation, learn this song so that you'll know when these things come to pass, it's me keeping my end of the covenant bargain to bring upon you all the curses. And it never dawns on people that in Revelation 15, verse 1, 2, and 3, he says, and they sang the song of Moses. Yep. So all of those covenant curses were coming upon not us. That's why, you know, uh, uh, I'm probably jumping way ahead Mm -hmm. of you here, but, you know, I mean, that's why it was called an accursed city is because all of those curses were about to come upon them. And the deal was, again, like you said, I believe in the prior segment, God said to them, now the land was subdued before you. In other words, the finished work gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we sat back waiting like we're waiting on God to do something else, but that was finished. And what he's saying is, how long will you not possess your possessions? In other words, I've handed it to you on a silver platter, literally. <laughs> yeah. And saying, you know, uh, if you don't take this, then all of these, all of these curses, in other words, if you choose to live here and you don't make this transition, 
then when this thing closes, this judgment's coming upon this here, system. Here, here's what I hear, you know, is that there, it's not just the church that teaches that there's still this future judgment to come. Any Now Hollywood, the world has gotten a hold of that. that. You know, our science would talk about, well, you know, uh, it's just a matter of time before the earth's destroyed by some cataclysmic event. You yeah. know, Hollywood, their biggest movies are some kind of apocalyptic yeah. movie. Yeah. That's what we're... So when you talk about faith, we talk about faith, it takes no faith really to believe that there's you know, God wants to destroy something. That takes no faith. What takes faith is that you are literally living in the promised land, and there is... And you're living like a stranger. And right you're living... There's, there's an abundance. There is an abundance left in this land for you to begin to receive. And, but, the, but, but we don't believe that. No, it can't be. Yeah. No, we got to wait. It's about for the, to fall away. Yeah. It's about to fall away. We got the last So we complain and serpents come The second, the second, come the second coming of Jesus hasn't come yet. And so we keep living in this bondage. Not by faith. Yep. And we keep on murmuring and serpents come among Matter us. Matter of fact, what <laughs> kept them in this wilderness for 40 years yeah. was unbelief. Yep. What brings you into this promised land and the abundance that's available to you right now is when somebody gets a hold of it by faith and says, prepare your victuals because in three days we're going over this Jordan. Three days. Again, death, burial, and resurrection. When you get a hold of what Jesus did. Slow down did, and say that again. <laughs> it's the, the three days. The three days. He said, after death, three days, you're going to cross over. Go ahead. Prepare your victuals. So he's, he, what he's, he's, it comes by the understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection. The finished work of Jesus is what will stir up faith yeah. and go, you know what? He's given us all things. Why this don't we ours. take it? Why are we living like this? Why are we living below? Look at that camera and tell the, somebody that. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Not someday. They're yes and amen right now. They're me it's meant for us not to have just enough to get by and God just meet our needs. But it's meant for us to have an abundance. It's not just meant, for, uh, you know, I believe in healing. I want to see people heal. I want to see miracles. But it's more than just having miracles and just getting, well, I need my healing right now. Well, I begin to live. Yeah. You're going to have some, some, some life in this body, and it only comes through faith. I believe the reason why we That's are dying, stuff. the reason why we are sick, the reason why there's all this poverty in the church and everything else is because we are still teaching old covenant and we're keeping people in bondage to unbelief. Yeah. And we're just waiting. Well, one day it'll get better. If not here, when I die. Yeah. But this is a life without end. Yeah. And no matter of fact, that's why Paul would say to live as Christ, to die as gain. Because what he's saying is, is no matter if I'm living in this body or not, I'm already in the promised land. Yeah. I'm already living in this. Yeah. It's just going. It just gets sweeter and sweeter. And so it's Enoch. Enoch walked with God. He was and was not. Why? Because he got a hold of something that yeah. kept him in the promised land continuously kept him in the presence of God continuously in life and beyond. Yeah. And so to me, it's getting a hold. When we get a hold of this life, this new covenant of faith, begin to stir people up in faith, they're going, we, we're going to begin to live. And we're not only just going to begin to live, we're going to begin to live in abundance. I walk outside. I'm telling you, I literally, here's why you cannot convince me in any other way. I walk outside my house. I live in my house, and it's heaven. Yep. I literally don't know how it gets any better sometimes, but it does. It gets better and better. It's like we used to sing the song, get sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a wall, love between my Lord and I. But we used to sing that song like it was like a woe song when it should have been a celebration of, man, this life really does get sweeter and sweeter. It gets better and better the more I am stirred up in faith and began to live. When they compass this city in the book of Joshua in chapter 6, like you said, they went in, they had seven priests, seven trumpets. They told Joshua told the people, don't say a word. Until I tell you. So they kept their mouth shut. The, it said that this, the inhabitants had closed up this city. The, the walls of the city were greatly shut up because the people's hearts had already melted. They walk around this city the first time, and they're just blowing these trumpets. It's, it's trumpets of ram's horn. Both, seven speaks of the completed finished work. Seven is the number for completion or it being finished. The ram's horn speaks of the death of the ram or the death of Christ. They're declaring the death of Christ in a perfect finished work. Yep. Do it once around this city. Sure, the first day they're like, man, the people inside that city, the people inside that city are probably like, oh man. But then nothing happened that day. Yeah. And are, you know, they might have felt a little better. I bet you by the seventh day, when they're encompassing this city and probably about the third or so time around, 
I bet you half the people in that city were gathered on that wall to laugh at those people saying, we thought you were going to do something incredible, but all you've done is marched around and blown some trumpets. Yeah. But I think that's Rahab... Powerful. All you've done is preach your message and nothing happened. And nothing's that, happened. That's powerful. And they're, they're probably mocking those people by that time. Yeah. Rahab, though, is sitting there with her family inside this scarlet color Scarlet color She says, because they, they told him, whoever's in your house is going to be saved, but whoever goes out, is the, their blood yeah, is on we, their head. Yeah. She's probably got no, she's probably telling them, no, I'm telling you, do you not hear what they're declaring? Yeah. Do you not hear what's being said? Because he that has an ear is going to hear what the Spirit's saying. And she's saying, there's something different. And she said, today, this is the day, this is the, the seventh time on the seventh day when you preach the perfection and the land, and, and they keep hearing the people kept their mouth shut just to hear the gospel being declared, the true gospel without mixture. Truly hearing what Jesus did, because I think it's important for us to, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. You have to hear the finished work. You have to hear about the grace of God, because that's going to stir up your faith to enter into this land. But when they got around the seventh time, Joshua said, shout. And when they shout it, they shout it with the pure word of the gospel. And the walls of that city fell. But here's the funny thing. Said the walls of that city fell, but Rahab's house was on the wall. Yeah. That's how she had let the spies out. Yeah. So when Joshua says, now go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman, it had to be that her house was the only one left. Yeah. It wasn't hard to know whose yeah, house which, which was, 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 was Rahab's <laughs> because the walls had fallen. But the gospel will, will establish your house in the time of trouble. In the time of trouble, when you're hearing the gospel, everything else may be falling down around you, but the gospel will establish your house and it will save everyone in it. That's how powerful the declaring of the gospel, the true finished work of Jesus is, is that everything, it'll cause everything else to fall and crumble, but it'll also establish and save your house. Yeah. And so she's standing there, but they bring her out. It says they camped there after they destroyed that city that day, and they camped there by Jericho, but her, they put her camp outside. It's, a, it's again, it's, a, it's another picture of the Gentiles that were outside. We're still in the middle of this transition. And so there, when, when that falls, but it says that Rahab began, she got into, she, she began to live with the people and she was there to this day. She also is only the one of the few women that is mentioned in the lineage of Christ. Yeah. Because something changed in that woman by hearing the gospel and by faith received all she did. Yeah. She didn't work. She didn't do anything. She had this scholar color cord and she simply believed the word that if you do yeah. this, Yep. Your house will be saved. Yep. L let me add this to it. For unless you, you no, go ahead. But I was thinking when, you know, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it's the great hall of faith. And it starts out by saying, by, well, not starts out, but, it, but when you get to the Exodus journey, it says, by yep. faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he left Egypt. By faith, he kept the Passover. Yep. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea. But the moment they crossed the Red Sea, there's nothing that makes it into the hall of faith that happened by faith for the next 40 years. And I always wondered why nothing after the Red Sea is mentioned. It's because after the Red Sea is where the law was given. Yep. And when the law was given, it shuts up faith. But the very next thing that happens by faith, it says, by faith, the harlot Rahab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by faith, the harlot Rahab simply believed God, and it was counted to her for righteousness. And I believe there's a lot of people right now that need to make this transition, because one of the things that I think has happened is that the law has shut up faith to people who don't even believe they're saved anymore. Go ahead. You, you, gonna... you, the, other, the other part of it is, is that he says this. He says this. He said, go into the house of the harlot and bring out the woman. Yep. Because the preaching of the gospel and faith changes people. Yeah. Not the law. The law shut up faith. They were sh she was shut up yep. in that city. See, here's the thing. She She'd was have been shut continued up. to be called a harlot, not a woman. She shut up in this old covenant system that kept her in bondage as a harlot. Yeah. That's all she'd ever be. That's all she ever could be. But the moment the walls of that city fell, she became free from that bondage. Yeah. By f faith caused something to happen that she was no longer a harlot any longer. She came out a woman. And the woman, it's not the harlot that gets into the lineage of Jesus. It's the woman yeah. that gets into the lineage yeah. of Jesus. Because it's a, the gospel truly changes people. It's not covering, a, you know, we, under, well, in old covenant systems, even in old covenant yeah. churches, 
We put on the the precious Jesus face. We put the on Babylonian the Babylonian garments. We know how to look. We know how to look good. We know how to do it right. But then behind those doors are such scandals, such uh, uh, just horrific things that are happening, and and then people. People lose their faith over that because it's still a bondage to this old covenant system. But when grace is truly preached, when faith is truly preached, it will set you absolutely free from anything you were in bondage to in your past. You are no longer going to be a harlot. You're going to be brought out a woman. You're no longer going to be a sinner saved by grace. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. That's the importance of these walls falling. And that's why he said, don't take anything from this city. It's an accursed city yep. because the moment we take things from this city, from this old covenant system, it's going to cause us to be defeated by sin. It's going to cause us to have to have a death because that's what the law does. The wages of sin is death. Yep. And the law is the power of sin. Yep. But when we get, when we hear the gospel being declared by these, these ram's horns, being blown by a true priesthood yep. that's bearing an ark called Christ, and it's showing us the finished work, and it's causing people to be quiet until they truly hear, they get a hold of what the Spirit's really saying. I think there's been so many people that stood up and they have preached about the destruction, how bad everything is, that it has shut up faith and it's not been the pure gospel. And it's time some people be quiet and hear what these trumpets of these priests are being declared so that we can truly see the walls yep. of this city fall and people be set free. Yep. You know, I was thinking while you were saying that, the Scripture says that, uh, you know, that the law was given so that every mouth would be stopped and all the world would become guilty to bring you to a place you say, I need a Savior. Maybe that's why he told them at Jericho, you got to get the people going in the same direction and tell them, keep your mouth shut. I think what's happening right now is God shutting the mouth of some, some people who preach in the wrong covenant. Just like Zechariah, yep. God said, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to open your mouth until you name this baby what I name it. You're not going to name it Zachariah Jr. or the law hopped up. You're going to name it John or Grace or Love. That's what John's name means. Yeah. And that was the pre-runner for Christ who would become our Messiah. We're out of time on this segment. I, we really, I hope you're enjoying this as much yeah. as we're enjoying doing it. But if you'd like to sow into this ministry to help us to be able to take this kind of a message around the world, please do that by going to our website at lenhouse.com and there's a place where you can give via credit card or debit card. You can even set up a monthly debit or give a one-time gift. It's very easy to do or you can scan that thing on the screen and it will take you directly to a link where you can do that. You can also give by check or money order by writing your check to Lynn Howes Ministries and sending it to the address on the screen or by calling the number on the screen. Someone will take your call. If you don't get an answer, leave a message. We'll return it. God bless you. See you next week. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.